You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and we got a really, really cool guest t- tonight. We worked extremely hard. I, I, I was trying to find somebody that could come on to talk about the inshore kayaking fishing opportunities, and just so we can start scratching the surface and bringing that to our community. I know everyone's been clamoring me for, for me to do this, along with doing fly fishing. And again, guys, that's coming. Um, I'm only one person, and I'm really blessed that we're able to have this individual on, though, to talk about inshore kayak fishing. Michael Burgess. Did I say that right this time? Close. Barges. Barges. Michael Barges. Don't there worry. Uh, every event that I'm ever at, nobody can say <laughs> it either. So you, you got pretty close. Dude, thank you so much for coming on. I, I again, like, I really appreciate it, uh, especially on short notice, to to be able to give this whole thing opportunity and just educate the public a little bit more about this really cool fishing opportunities that we have here. Yeah, I'm I'm really happy to be on. Thank you for uh, thank you for reaching out. I uh, I'm I've been a I've been a a member of this community for about 15 years, and uh, I'm I'm shocked that you have been able to find more people that want to talk about it. Honestly, it, it, to me, it's kind of like it's. What I found out when I started this thing is you have the trout guys, you have the bass boat guys, you have the bass bank guys, you have the catfish guys, and no one wants to talk. Yeah, And and that's what's so crazy to me. And then when I would go to meetings, especially about like the the Potomac River, uh, largemouth population, all this other stuff, everyone agreed that there was an issue with the fishery um, or the Shenandoah River because I grew up actually in Loudoun County when the Shenandoah had the big fish kill. All the groups agreed there was a problem, but none of them wanted to get in a room and talk because they all hated each other. And it's like, well, you understand if we all came together and said, like, we care about the fish and the river, yeah, we'd have a bigger voice. Yeah. And so that's what I'm hoping with this podcast to do is like, you know, we all like to fish. You know, I'm going to try to hit every single niche and just get us all together to talk about the different perspectives of the bodies of water. Because if the bodies of water are healthy, you know, whether it's trout, bass, snakehead, catfish or, or our saltwater species, everyone will have room to have fun for generations to come. And I know I, I don't need to get into that spiel, but I do want to hear yours about what what is your history? What got you to Maryland? Yeah, so so I came uh, I came from southwestern Virginia. I, I grew up fishing trout. Honestly, I was a, a fly guy and a, a smallmouth bass guy, and uh, I did a lot of fishing on Smith Mountain Lake. My uh, my parents had a house there growing oh, cool. up, and uh, did a lot of a lot of dock fishing, a lot of bank fishing. Honestly, a lot of carp fishing. Uh, wasn't a bass guy at all. I think I, I mentioned that that to you in our, our earlier chalk that. Um, just bass never did it for me. I loved carp fishing. I loved bluegill fishing. Um, bluegill was like crack for me. And so I, I, I just, I just got, uh, I got really into that got really into trying to, trying to trick them on different things, trying to t- trick them on flies that I had tied. And then, so I went, I went off to college, was, uh, was at Virginia tech, did a lot of fly fishing there. Uh, really enjoyed going out to North Carolina, fishing the Appalachian mountains. Um, and, 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 you know, for us, like, some in some places catching a four inch blue like a four inch brook trout was a trophy like just really? hiking up hiking over waterfalls climbing up into this pristine water cold mountain streams i loved it so like fishing with a one weight and just you know something you tied and catching like a seven inch brook trout was amazing and so when i came up here after college i thought i was done with fishing i i gave away my canoe i i didn't bring my fishing stuff up because i was like there's no fishing up there um, but thankfully, um, a family friend of mine, um, our fr- family friend of my uncle's, uh, was a hook and line striper guy. And so he invited me out said, Hey, I heard you like the fish. Let me show you the striper fish around the Potomac. And I was in, I, I, uh, I went with him as much as I possibly could when I lived in Arlington. And then I started branching out. I, uh, went to the local Orvis there. There's this thing called the title Potomac fly rotters, uh, association. I think that's what it's called. Um, they were just standing up. There was a, a guy, Dan, there with a ginormous beard that I met at Orbis. And he was like, hey, you should come to a meeting. Went to the meeting and met, met this guy that was like, hey, have you heard of kayak fishing? And I was like, I, you know, I have a canoe, but I, I'm not really interested in going out on the Potomac on it because I don't want to die. And he's like, no, you get a kayak. Like, it's got scuppers. You're not going to, you don't have to worry about flooding out and all that stuff. And so I went and bought a kayak. And he and I, you know, we we went out fishing and, um, it was a whole new world. I, 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 I brought all my fishing stuff up from, from Arlington, uh, from home to Arlington. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh, said I had deceived her, uh, that she didn't know that I was as big of a fisherman as I, I may have, <laughs> uh, have been. 
uh, now we're married. She still accuses me of that. Um, and so I went, I went hard in the Potomac and I, I really got invested in the shad fishery. The tidal Potomac fly riders, uh, group is really, uh, really cool. If you guys are out there, like they're, they're all about people catching shad, um, in proximity of DC and the capital area and Fletcher's Cove. And so like, I was all in on that. I was a rock hopper jumping around, catching shad, started catching blue cats, started catching stripers. And then, you know, just wanted to get out there and, and see bigger water. And so I got the kayak, started fishing around the Bay Bridge, um, met a guy out there at the Bay Bridge that had stood up this site called snagline.com and uh, it turned out to be this, this sort of kayak forum. And so back then there was like 20 of us and then it grew to about 4,000 people. Uh, over the years, we stood up a kayak fishing tournament, uh, Chesapeake Bay Kayak Association at, at our peak. We ran it for about six or seven years. We had about 115 people at our peak. Um, our, our purpose was about raising money for some local charities, uh, Coastal Conservation Association of Maryland and Make-A-Wish Foundation of Maryland. And uh, it was really about building a community. Um, and so I, I really just, I was all in on kayak fishing. So far with your story, fly fishing was a major part of it. What got you? Because that is very, I don't know, like I, I grew up with, with the Mickey Mouse pole from Walmart. what my okay. parents got me into. Like what, what got you into fly fishing? Um, I, I honestly, I, I don't know. My, my dad and my, uh, my grandfather and, and one of my uncles apparently were big fly fishermen. And so I think at some point I just was like, what the heck is this thing? Like, what is this? what is this uh, different rod that you have to cast the line? You don't cast the lure. Why is it harder? Um, and so I, I started asking questions and then I, I sort of got indoctrinated into this bait fishing game that was about going to catch bluegills to catch flathead catfish. Mm. So it was all about, Hey, we don't, we're not really fly fishermen. And in their sense, uh, my dad and some of the others were trout fishermen, but they also partaked in the, uh, the bluegill fishery. Um, but it was really about catching bait to catch like dinner. It was about catching, you know, bait to catch uh, flathead catfish in the new river. And so they had fly rods around. I was like, what is this? Um, and then they gave me one. And I just sort of, you know, I, I, we didn't have YouTube back then. Right. Uh, I just sort of figured it out of like, how do you cast and, and sort of struggled through it. And I think I accidentally hooked a carp and I was, I was in. Like that, I was in. That would be a heck of a fight. Like that I was <laughs> on a uh, five weight, uh, crystal river, Walmart special fiberglass rod. Like I was, I was in that, that freshwater bonefish or freshwater redfish was just, you know, it was peel and drag. And I was like, I don't know what to do, but like, this is awesome. Uh, and so then I started trying to figure out how to tie bread flies. Cause you know, we, we would chump carp with bread. Uh, and then just try to get more sophisticated. So I, that, that's, that's probably what draw, drew me to fly fishing. And then it was about, you know, I don't know if you've ever, you know, if I, don't, I think you mentioned fly fishing and wanted to talk more about it, but like swinging a streamer and, and hooking a smallie or hooking a nice trout, like there's just something amazing about swinging a streamer and knowing like, Hey, I'm, I'm hitting the spot, I'm coming up, boom. And then strip setting, like it's, it's pretty much crack. I, I, that's something I want to get into again. Like, I mean, my, my history, uh, you, you guys that have watched the show before, you know, I went college bassing, high school bass fishing. I tried to go pro with it, but the, I, I, I want to try fly fishing. I've seen so many of my friends that do it. Uh, Nolan Miner is another one that does it. And it looks like so much freaking fun. And I don't know. I just feel like you get more in tune with things, especially when you have to tie the fly, you got to match the hatch. I really like getting nit and into the weeds about that stuff. Yeah. And I feel like with fly fishing, you, you can indulge that. Well, now that you say that, you know, I, I had a, so, so later on, right. And as I, I was going into high school, I had a, a, a high school biology teacher that was really all about teaching us about the life cycle of bugs. And so he was a fly fisherman and, um, he would talk about the nymph stage and the larva stage and, and the emergence and, the, and, and just the whole thing. And, um, so we would tie flies. Like he, I would stay after class. He would talk to me about the different patterns. He'd talk to me about the different trout that he was catching, um, he and I, like, he took us out, like he took a, a group trip on the, um, from the high school that I was in, they go fly fishing. And I was, I was all about it. So I was in my basement, tying flies, learning about different species in the area, learning about different, different phases of their life cycle. And, um, I was, I was hooked, uh, honestly. And I, um, I would probably tie somewhere between like, I don't know, it's not, a, it's not a large number for people that tie flies, but for as a kid that didn't have means to buy fly tying, uh, materials like it was kind of a video I would, I would tie a couple hundred flies a, a, a winter 
and um you know i would experiment and and try different like different um different sort of things that i couldn't find books on again like we didn't have the internet resources that we have today but i had a fly that i was like this is my pattern it was this cool like emergence fly that had like a bend down where you had the the fly sort of emerging to the to be a a, a, a I don't know, there's a word That's for so it right cool. but, but like being able to fly actually and so you had this catalyst that was falling or this um crystallis that was falling down and um man i caught the crap out of trout and i would go down to like places like stone mountain or the mitchell river in north carolina when i was at when i was in blacksburg and um something just really validating about being able to to look at nature look at the look at look at what the fish are eating and then being able to mimic that I, was something that you created that's the thing with fly fishermen that i don't I, I people that aren't fly fishermen don't appreciate is you guys are so observant about nature and everything that's going on i think way more than bass guys generally speaking because you're there and you're observing things um, oh yeah and, yeah and Flip, I, flipping rocks like looking looking for helgamites looking for whatever the fish are eating um if, if you happen to kill a fish and look in their stomachs that's that's kind of how we do it now but like you know, just looking at that environment and saying like, okay, this, this needs a little bit of pink, or this needs a little bit of pearl. This needs a little bit of this because that's going to match the natural forage. And then getting that validation that, that, Hey, I obviously matched because I caught a fish. Um, it's pretty cool. I, I, I really enjoyed that. And don't worry guys, we're going to get, we're going to get to intro kayak fishing. It's what's nice about doing this long form content is we can go down tangents that I think really are interesting because you, you really learn more about people than just the Q and a, um, and, and you talked about the flathead catfish. I think this is a great segue to that because, uh, for the people that live up here near Williamsport, Maryland, uh, on the upper Potomac, we know we have a flathead issue. Uh, we also have a blue cat issue on the tidal river. So uh, honestly, what, what is your back history with, with the flathead? So, so I grew up in uh, Southwest Virginia and my, my dad's family was from West Virginia. And so I grew up like flathead was like the pinnacle of our fishery. We loved them. Um, they loved to eat them. We loved to catch them. Um, and so they were kind of cool as, a, as a, a catfish in the fishery that we were in and that they would eat live bait. Like they would do bluegill. They would do a soft shell crab, fi uh, soft shell crayfish. They would eat, um, you know, a number of different things and they would fight and they were good to eat. And so we loved them. Mm -hmm. Um, and then moving up here and finding out that, Hey, there's, there's big flatheads in the Occoquan, there's big flatheads, um, now up in the Susky, there's big flatheads in a couple other places that I knew about at the time. Um, I was really interested in going out and catching them. And, um, unlike, I guess, channel cats or other, other catfish that I, I think that, um, people are more traditionally familiar with, you know, they're, they're predators, right? Um, there, there was a, there was some, you know, back to the segue to kayak fishing, there was a group down in Richmond that that was really, um, really trying to popularize this kayak fishery of being able to go out and catch catch bluegills, fish certain seams, and catch like forty inch flatheads from the kayak, um, pretty much on the regular. And and I think that was kind of a, a cool push for for kayak fishermen down there to be like, hey, I, I didn't know that James had this to offer. I didn't know that that flatheads were so accessible. I didn't know they were um, more of a game fish than I thought. Um, you know, I think people have this connotation with catfish of like, I'm going to go soak bait. I'm going to go wait for a couple hours and I might get it. I might get a bite. Um, flatheads are pretty interactive and they can be fun. What's interesting to me is I, I believe with my interactions with flatheads, they're way more of a voracious predator. It seems like than a blue cat, but yet blue cats can definitely dominate a fishery. And I wonder why that is where it seems like the flatheads don't. Or could I be wrong there that, that flatheads don't take over a fishery as bad as blue cats would? Yeah, so I, I, I'm not sure about how, um, you know, what the reproduction rate is on blue mm -hmm. cats versus flatheads, but I would say that blue cats seem far more prolific at, at spawning and, and just far more prolific at adapting to a, a, an environment. And it seems like blue cats will eat anything, they'll eat dead bait, they'll eat live bait, they'll eat lures. I've caught blue cats on top water, I've caught them on spinner baits, I've caught them on, on swim baits. We've caught them jigging. We've caught them trolling. We've caught them trolling like four miles an hour by accident when we were trying to move spots and you catch a blue cat and you're like, what in the absolute world was this thing thinking? Um, I just think the blue cats are more adaptable. I, mm -hmm. I think that the flatheads, um, they, they stick to their pattern. Uh, they stick to sort of the environment that they prefer and, and blue cats are just far more adaptable and, and they seem to be more prolific. Um, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I'm really worried about blue cats in our fishery and just how much of the biomass that they're occupying and just how many places that you're finding blue cats that you wouldn't expect. 
Talk about that a little bit more because I know we mentioned that that off air, and this is something else we're going to get. And don't worry, guys, we have on, I'm going to get some kayak catfish guys specifically on there. We're getting some people from the state to talk about the catfish because it is a it's it's a niche in the population of people that enjoy fishing. But we also want to talk about the pros and the cons, both sides of it. I want everyone to have their ability to say their piece. But you talked a little bit about that they can handle salinity, correct? They don't. Yeah, they don't have to talk to fresh water. Yeah, so they. I mean, uh, kind of like. You know, I think we're going to talk about this later also, but kind of like the snakeheads, they, um, they broke out of the fishery that they were, they were introduced into and they, they spread throughout the bay. And it, it just seems like, um, my opinion, and, and there's probably science to back this up, but it seems like every year you're finding them in places that you, you that are more and more, um, that have a higher and higher salinity or more and more closer to the bay that you just wouldn't expect to find blue cats in. Um, example of that for me. So when I was in Arlington, I fished the 301 bridge quite a bit. Um, there is a huge blue cat population around the 301 bridge. I think people know that, but like you're fishing warm water di discharges, you're fishing, um, rubble piles and you're fishing, you know, striper lures, like things like this that I'm, I'm playing with. And, um, you're catching blue cats like crazy. I mean, you're catching them on lures, you catch them on cut bait, you're catching them on live bait. You can't get something down there without catching a blue cat. And that has generally been the, um, you know, sort of that title line of where, um, you would expect saltwater cutoff to be, and sort of from that point forward, you're 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 kind of more on that that uh, fresher water. Um, but blue cats are down there; they're further down from there. Um, they're big, they're mean. Uh, they can be really fun in a kayak. Uh, we actually did kayak wars one year, um, and that was a thing. I don't know if people remember that tournament. Um, and we got really interested, uh, really, really into fishing for blue cats at the time around the Woodrow Wilson Bridge and around the 301 Bridge, and uh, it, you know, um, it could be every drop and they were, they're actually a pretty fun kayak fishing, uh, pursuit because, um, they're, they're big and they're mean and, uh, they'll bite on all sorts of different things. So how, how far down have you caught them? Like to the salinity level, I guess. So I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have a way of measuring that, but, yeah. um, certainly, um, certainly south of the 301 bridge, um, probably around, I'm trying to think of the name of that area. Not not all the way down to Point Lookout, right? Not not that far, but um, certainly between like Piney is it Piney Point? It's been a while since I fished down there, but um, I used to catch them all all around uh, like like 30 marker, um, which is out uh, past 301 Bridge South. Wow. Um, and you're you know you're catching 30 40 inch blue cats and um it's just not what you'd expect and you're you're generally fishing striper waters for us we're, we're trying to catch stripers and catching blue cats and um the old hook and liner that I, I think i mentioned earlier that i i i learned how to striper fish in this area from they hate them they don't they don't eat them they don't want them um they're they're just viewed as a as a trash fish for them um it seemed um now there seems to be more folks that are trying to figure out how to export them how to how to make a commercial fishery how to how to find ways to to make um, lemonade out of lim lemons, if you will. And, uh, it just seems like, it just seems like we don't really have a handle on, um, where they are, how many they are and, and, uh, what kind of impact they're having on the environment. Yeah. It'll be interesting in, in years to see what their impact is and what we can actually do. I mean, I, I like to be a little optimistic. Um, if you guys haven't listened to the Odenkirk episode, you really should. It's good. It's a good listen to, um, that maybe life finds a way and it balances out because it's better to think that than the uh, alternative, but hopefully if the alternatives were going, maybe we can do something about it, um, to balance it out. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I don't know that blue, fi blue crab, I mean, blue catfish are ever satiated. I don't know that, um, they're going to hit a peak where they're like, Hey, we, the, the environment can't support more of us. They just seem to diversify in what they're eating. Mm -hmm. no. So all these different initiatives to restore oysters or restore crabs or restore shad or restore these different fisheries that are more native river herring. Um, it just seems like blue cat are sitting there like, yes, please more and more and more. Um, and they just continue to get bigger. Like it used to be at Fletcher's, um, you know, rock hopping, you could jig for striper and, and do really well, especially before the sun came up. Um, nowadays it's, it's, it's mostly blue cats that we would catch. So with that said, as an inshore angler, what are you generically targeting, whether you're from the shore or, or from a kayak? For me, I, um, stripers is, is the number one thing that I fish for, for, um, sport. 
but for for things that I want to bring home, it's it's white perch. Like I I I would rather eat white perch than any other fish that we have in the Chesapeake Bay. Okay. Other than maybe snakehead. Um, so I I uh, I love white perch fishing. I love ultralight fishing. Maybe that's back to my trout days. I uh, I really enjoy light line stuff. Um, but I, I I like striper fishing, speck, speckled trout, and um, it seems to be as the you know I don't know if it's global warming or just some sort of pattern that we're in. It seems that every year we get a couple we get a couple more pods of redfish, and so I um, I really enjoy trying to catch these uh, these big big red drum. I, you know, I heard that too. And it's also, um, if you guys want to go back when, when, when I was talking to, um, I think Brian um, escapes me from, uh, to fish and paddle, he talked about like this, there's inflow of more redfish and trout into our, our estuaries in the Eastern shore. And I hope that just means like we're doing better with the conservation that they're coming here because the water clarity is better and the forage yeah. is better. I mean, do you, do you agree with that or is that so I, you know, I, I've, you know, it sounds silly to say I've only been fishing this area for about 15 years. And, um, in my time, it really seems like redfish have had a couple ebbs and flows of like 2011. I feel like we had this like crazy good, uh, puppy drum fishery. Like you're catching 13 to 25 inch redfish, like pretty regularly in, in a number of different places across like the Patuxent fishery, the, you know, even as far North as the Severn, Eastern Bay, Eastern shore, I mean, we, we had an awesome puppy drum fishery. Um, then it kind of tailed off. And so um, I don't know if it's just a cycle. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the uh, the initiative for the, the, you know, not killing the trophy drum, anything over 27 inches that we're not killing in Maryland now. I don't know if those initiatives are really um, what we can think uh, or if it's just the, the entire coastal conservation um, efforts that are going on along the Atlantic seaboard to, to protect those breeder fish. But like... Um, I don't think anyone should eat an old drum. Like, I don't, I don't know that anyone, like, I don't know that anybody recently has, but, um, from what I can tell, like they're full of worms, they're old, they're, they're, they're oily. Like it's not a good table fare. Um, they are much more valuable sport fish. They're much more valuable breeder fish. And I wish we could take a play out of that, that playbook for stripers and realize like, Hey, maybe this trophy fishery that we have, uh, maybe we'd be better served in not doing that. Uh, maybe we'd be better served in letting these these fish that um, can produce millions of eggs and have the genetics to produce large fish. Uh, maybe we'd be better served as a as a, a sport fishing and, and recreational fishing and commercial fishing um, group to to stop killing those fish. Um, so we we've been fortunate enough the last probably five years to be able to find forty plus inch redfish um, in Maryland waters. Wow. Um, along the Eastern shore, especially, um, as far North for me is, um, Eastern shore. I mean, I'm sorry, Eastern Bay. Um, we've had a pretty good fishery for, and I, and I've heard of people catch them in the, in the, um, in the Chester, which I'm blown away by, um, or North of the Bay bridge. And, um, you know, I think we're going to see more of that as the waters continue to warm. And as those fish stay protected, um, I think other initiatives that I'd love to see, uh, the Bay take a bigger, uh, concerted stance between Maryland and Virginia on is, is protecting the, 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 um, the bait fish. So CCA Maryland's done a really good job of trying to advocate for restoring river herring or, 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 um, protecting bunker that are in the bay and, and stopping some of the commercial fishery, um, off, you know, the mouth of the bay or along the Eastern seaboard for, um, Menhaden or bunker. Um, I think, that's one of those things that people often forget about is, you know, these, these fish, if you want bigger fish, they need, they more, they need more, um, caloric rich diets. Amen. And so you got people screaming about, Hey, you know, with the, the resurgence of these redfish and other fish, they're killing all the crabs or they're, they're killing this other fish. Well, you know, it's an ecosystem. We, we got to focus on the entirety. And so for, for, if we as humans are removing all of these bait fish from the environment, well, what, are they, what else are they going to eat? So mm -hmm. um, I, I've been fortunate enough in my kayak fishing career to, to chase um, stripers from North Carolina all the way up to Maine and going up there to the Northeast and, and Maryland, I mean, um, New York and, and Massachusetts and, and getting on 40 plus inch stripers on a, on a pot of bunker, real bunker, like 16 inch, 18 inch bunker and live lining those things or, or throwing big plugs. You're like, is this what the Chesapeake used to be like? You're like, why, why don't I have this fishery at home? Why don't, why don't, why can't I catch these fish 
you know, sure the waters are warm, but why can't I catch these fish in the spring? Why can't I catch these fish in the fall when those bunkers should be in our, our environment and those fish should be in our environment? Well, they're, they're staying offshore because they don't have anything to eat in the bay now. So I, I'd love to see us take a, a, a better stance on protecting some of those resources so that we have those fish that, that have something to eat. No, I, I completely agree with you. And that's something we talk about in the freshwater too, is it's not just about the in introduction of, of a predator, but it, it's the ecosystem. Um, I, I read in a, um, it, was a, it was a Texas, it was a Texas study about if you want to grow big buck, you got to make sure it's got good feed. Yeah. It's, not, it's not just about the genetics, it's about the feed. And so whether it's a largemouth bass, a trout or a striper, do they have enough to eat? Or if you're separating the lower, lower part of the ecosystem, that's going to be an issue. Um, but hopefully now we're, we're going to start, we're going to start doing the right things to actually bring the bay back. Um, it's gone through its ebbs and flows. I like to think that, that the future is going to be bright for it, especially, you know, the idea of like having redfish, trout, striper, bluefish all in the bay, that is a inshore fisherman's just paradise. That would be amazing to see that happen someday. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been lucky this year. I haven't been out as much as in years past, but I've been lucky this year to luck into, um, three or four red drum over 40 inches, um, speckled trout fishing. So like, mm. um, you know, like catching a, catching a 40 inch red drum on a, on a rod that you had planned for a speckled trout, um, is a surprise. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's one of those things that I think we're uniquely advantaged on a kayak and that, um, you know, I think people always think, ah, oh, I need like heavier gear or something in a kayak. You don't like you, you, you are the drag, like mm -hmm. you are getting pulled in the water. You're, you're, your drag might not be going off as much, but like you're going on a tow, you're going on a Chesapeake sleigh ride and like, it's awesome. So like everybody, I don't know, like I, 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 I'm a bit of a gear hound. If you, if you, uh, if you ask people about me, I've, I've been on, a, I've been the Goldilocks of trying to find the right gear for the right fish and, and going down that path. And I've really just sort of settled on, you don't need all that stuff. You, you, you need a rod that has maybe 15, 10 to 15, 20 pound braid, uh, medium to medium heavy, and you can catch anything in the bay. You probably catch anything on the coast with that in a kayak because it's just going to pull you. And um, going three to four miles an hour while a redfish is pulling you, it's awesome. Like That's there's so there's cool. there's no reason to go harder than that, and um, it's 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 a blast. Something we talked about, we'll, I, we'll go right into this next, is kayaking freshwater is completely different than doing inshore and salt. And and you have basically, I mean, you've done it all. You, you've been out in the ocean doing this stuff. You've done, and we'll probably get into this at, at the end. You went with um, Field Trips Robert Field. I did, yeah. Out there into the unknown with, with massive sharks. And, and so there's a different way you need to approach this than a dad and his kid going to Dick's Sporting Goods and maybe buying a kayak. And then, hey, we're going to go try this. Um, for the people at home, like, generically because it is more dangerous let's just like spoilers here guys this is way more serious than going to your to your river or your lake what do you need to do i guess for the entry level to be safe to be able to go out there and have fun yeah so i i, I probably I'm, I'm probably a little um i probably sound a little bit more um strict about this but um for me it's uh assume no one's going to help you but you uh and so that's that's my general premise is you should be able to self-rescue you should have alternate means for uh, for propulsion. You should you should be prepared. Um, I don't want to ever be anyone's problem but my own kayak fishing. I don't ever want a coast guard to come out. I don't ever want a boater to save me. Um, but you know, in the worst case scenario, I want to be able to signal them. I want to be able to call them on a radio. And so I always try to be prepared. And so I'm I'm actually really um, really fixated on the safety side. And I think we talked about it a little bit earlier of like. I love night fishing. I don't talk about night fishing a lot because I don't want to encourage people that aren't prepared to go out night fishing to go night fishing. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, you won't catch me without a life jacket. You won't catch me without a spare paddle. You won't catch me. Um, you won't catch me without a couple other safety devices. Um, VHF radio, whistle, mirror, maybe. I don't, I don't really have a mirror, but I have, I have other signaling devices if I needed to. But my general premise is no one's going to help me but me. And so we, you know, over my, over my lifetime in the, in the, in the sport, um, we've had a couple incidents where, where people just really weren't prepared and really weren't ready for some of the environmentals that they went out in. I, um, I can think back to a time on the Susquehanna flats in the early April, trying to, you know, trying to catch trophy striper and, and finding a guy in a brand new kayak, first time out, put a trolling motor on it, put all these accessories on it, put a giant milk crate on it full of accessories uh took a wave broadside while trying to take a leak with his waders down 
and here he is turtled holding on to it nobody mm. can see him because his kayak's like olive and i just happen to be near him and be like holy crap man are you okay and try to help him get his kayak up went and found a boat got him towed out and um for me it was it was i was mad at the guy i was mad because um you should never put your in a, yourself in a situation where you've got to depend on someone else as a kayaker um it's just sort of my ethos and I, and i know that that's probably maybe a little harsh for for folks that are getting into it but i really hope people take that to heart and say like i need to be prepared i need to be um you know, conversing is the right word, but I need to be capable of flipping my kayak over, understanding what my limits are, understanding what my kayak's limits are, and understanding what I can handle. And if you and if you don't know what those are, like I encourage you not to take any rods. Like go out in a storm, go out when it's windy, go out and figure out like how your kayak tracks, how it kayak, how you can paddle when it's windy or when you've got waves hitting you broadside and you've got your feet in the water. Like just experiment, test your test your limits in a safe way so that you have that exposure and you have that experience. Um, for us, you know, I was, I was a lot younger back then and we did a lot of dumb stuff. We, we went out in storms, we went out in rough weather. And honestly, like that's, that's kind of one of the cool things about a kayak is there is no situation other than maybe a really harsh thunderstorm where you can't find protective water and find fish. Like, you know, it's blowing 20, it's blowing 30. Like I can find, I can find an eddy somewhere and I can still fish. Boats, uh, boats might not have that ability. We can't cover a lot of water in those situations, but like I can find fish. And so we've been out in situations where like I couldn't see, you know, people that were as, you know, as close as we are on screen. I couldn't see you because the, the trough that I was in was, you know, six mm. to eight feet. God here damn. I am, here Aww. you are. Uh, or, you know, you know, I think we joked about this earlier that I would tell you like, we went on some mothership trips off Hatteras. We went 20, 30 miles out, went jigging for blackfin tuna. And um, there was like eight foot to 12 foot swells. And, you know, I'm at the bottom of a trough. My buddy's at the top. And in between us is like a 12 foot dusky. And wow. it's bigger than my kayak. I'm looking at it in the eye. He's up here. He's he's over top of me. And there's just a shark. And I'm like, what, what am I doing here? That is Why? wild. What am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I was all in. Like I, I, it was, it was uh, catching a tuna from a kayak kind of ruined the Chesapeake Bay for me for a bit. Of like, hey, this was, this was crack, and um, I loved it. And so going back to Panama for going to Panama this this past fall with Robert Fields, um, and Dakota Dunmire, like that was that was an awesome trip for us. That was a bucket list kind of thing. And uh, what is I that didn't like? catch like what what is that like to go out it was a blast like, yeah it was a blast uh, so we we didn't always mothership we, we paddled out a, a okay. day or two but um uh you know going out on the pangas throwing them in and then just dropping on these reefs and catching big fish was was all was awesome um you know like one of the days we went out like two two hour panga ride and uh uh mike rosa who won the trip at the the fishing paddle because he's he's got a golden horseshoe um okay. uh, somewhere in his body we're not sure where we want to extract it because he keeps killing us. Um, he he hooked a Pacific sailfish within like 30 seconds of us being on the spot. He was the first dude in the water mm -hmm. through a bonito. Here comes this like four foot Pacific sailfish and almost almost speared people in the boat because he was like, I don't know, 10 feet off the boat and hooked up and this thing jumped up and it, it scared the crap out of everybody. It how, was do you, how do you fight these things that can literally eat you? Like, how do you use your boat as a drag system without like going under like is there a science to that or is it an art form of, of, of fighting these fish so, that are so big so in panama those guys will yell at you keep your rod to the front you know you you want to be able to have that because if you're if you're off to the side like you, you know you're, you're obviously you're more tippy right you're gonna tip I, I i'll send you a picture it's on my facebook uh or it's in that presentation that i sent you and i'm it looks like i'm 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 about to explode because i uh, i had a tuna on and then like halfway up I don't know what kind of shark, maybe a hammerhead or a dusky ate the, ate the tuna. And here I am two thumbs on the drag. I've got 50 pound drag on and I can't break it. Like you can't, you can't break that high of, um, uh, pound test line while you're, uh, while you're sitting. Yeah, there you go. Right. While you're sitting there in a kayak, you just, you don't have any leverage to break it. So like, I'm just gripping, ripping, hmm. and this thing is screaming drag. And I, you know, I can't do anything to stop it. And, uh, and, and that's kind of, that's kind of the thing. Like, don't put your rod there. Was the was the is the the moral of that story. So you want to you want to have your rod at the front. Um, but the cool thing is, is you know, it's kind of like Jaws, right? You're you're the buoy. 
you're getting mm-hmm. towed around. Like that thing's going to, that, that big fish is going to pull you around. So like, you know, everyone, I don't, I don't know what it is. It's probably, it's probably every fishery, right. But I, for something about kayak fishing, like no matter where I am, if I'm on the water, if I'm, if I'm talking to somebody, they always wonder like, what's the biggest fish you've ever caught in a kayak? I'm like landed or hooked, you know, hooked 14 inch or 14 foot hammerhead or 14 foot shark. It's probably the biggest thing I've ever hooked for biggest thing I've ever landed. Um, it's probably a 50 some inch drum or striper. Um, not nearly the same fight as shark. Um, how long did that last? Well, you know, if you want to talk fish stories, my, um, my favorite fish story is I was fishing a, a CCA Maryland tournament a couple of years ago. And, um, I had fished, started like lines in at five 30 or 6 AM. And I had fished, it was like 2 PM and I was headed or 1 PM, 2 PM. I don't remember what lines out were, but I was headed back and I, I brought a perch rod. Like I brought a perch rod with me because I want to catch some white perch. As I mentioned earlier, <laughs> I, lo- I, I love to eat white perch. So I've got like, I don't know, six pound test braid, uh, 10 pound leader. Oh, he's going heavy. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, like a little baby spinner bait, uh, a perch pounder. And I, I hooked up with a, a 40 plus inch red drum and, Damn. uh, I thought it was a countless race. So I'm like, I'm trying to break it. I, I just want to be done. I'm, I'm burned out. I've, I've, I've kayaked around an Island. I've gone through the circuit. I, I probably did 22 miles or more that morning and I'm done. Like, I just want to, I just want to drink some water, have some food tired of power bars. And, uh, you know, I paddle up to it to try to get my, my perch pounder back. Cause that's the cool thing about the Hobie or, or pedal drive is, um, I didn't start kayaking because I wanted to get the exercise I wanted to fish. And so when I realized I didn't have to hold a paddle and I could hold my rod, I, I got pretty interested in the Hobie. And so that's, uh, that's one of the cool things about the Hobie is I was able to pedal after this red drum and, and try to get my lure back. It turned out it wasn't a count as Ray. And so here I am with this basically ultralight rod bent over and I was in a tournament. So I was like, holy cow, I want to, I want to get this thing in. I want to, mm-hmm. I want to kayak or whatever the grand prize was for the, for the kayak tournament. I fought that thing and this was COVID. So it was different rules. It was, it was like an internet check-in. So I don't think there was a hard and fast cutoff data when he had to, had to put the fish in, but I fought that thing for four and a half hours. Holy sh! It pulled me for, um, I, I went in, on Navionics and tried to map out how far it pulled me, but it was, it was a good five miles. Went all the way down this, this, the one side of the river, back to the other side, back up, back down. Uh, there was a thunderstorm that happened in the middle mm. and I thought I was going to die because there's like lightning happening. My hair stood up. I'm getting torrential downpour. And the, the horrible thing was again, cause it's the Hobie. I can paddle up to it. So I can see this fish the entire time. I can see how big it is. I'm like, Holy crap. This is, 45 48 inches um but i can't i can't get closer than 10 feet every time i get to 10 feet it goes to the bottom it takes off um and so i i just fought that thing forever and i'm i had a had a drum rod with me so like i was trying to hold my other rod out and like hook it in the mouth um and i eventually lost it eventually like cut me cut itself on the rudder and um now it's just a fish story and so when i called my wife on the way home and i said hey i'm sorry i'm five hours later than i said <laughs> i would be i have a fish story she just thought it was a fish story um but that thing that was a nice fish huge shout out to gopro for making these fish stories believable to our wives nowadays um uh, I, I wish i had my gopro <laughs> with me yeah, i i didn't uh because you know i who who thinks you're going to catch that on a perch rod uh but that's when they're going to bite though i don't care what it's, it's always when you're not expecting it yeah that, that's i was freaking... prepared for a, a 10 to 13 inch perch not a not a red drum that's like the guy that caught the cobia too like do you, do you ever go out there like that's the thing about the ocean compared to like fresh water you don't know what's gonna bite it's not like the guy with the cobia that guy was he was he was ready he had a really? plan i'm not kidding like i i talked to him he had a plan he knew where he was going he was he was ready he was dialed in he was he was cobia fishing that's insane. And, um, you know, if you talk to Robert or, uh, Brian, I think he even mentioned it before the tournament, right. That there was going to be a Cobia category. If you go back and listen to it, um, the guy that he's talking about is the guy that won because <laughs> he was the guy that was pushing him all winter and saying, I'm going to go out and catch a Cobia. I know where they are. And damn it. If he did, like he, he, that's went impressive. Out and did it. Um, and I think I was joking with you earlier before this of like, um, we were all out there fishing, fishing paddle. It's a great time. Everybody should do it. Um, it's a really challenging place to fish on a kayak though. Like that ocean city inlet is, um, it's rough. It's not just rough because of the current. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of water moving through there, but the boat traffic, the, um, 
just for people that aren't aren't familiar with fishing and current it, it's a hard place to fish in a kayak um and so like hearing that he had a plan he'd been plotting on it for a year plus and he went and did it and connected and then you know caught this huge fish um was awesome but like we had been out that morning we you know a, amongst the group of us uh, one of us had caught a, a pretty nice striper and we we're like oh man you won this tournament you you got a keeper striper in june late june like nobody's gonna have a fish this big you probably are gonna place and then just seeing that thing hanging there and be like oh man you might you might not even place this year like you got a 15 pound striper like you're use your chopped liver like that's that that is unheard of in this in this um in this kind of fishery so like it's pretty cool this year that that's uh, and hopefully we get him on the show i'm gonna be I, hopefully he responds to me so we can get him on the show too because like yeah there's a story there about what went into him planning to do that because again this is not like a like a big boat where you're just gonna throw down the yamaha or the merc and go to a spot like it's oh, an yeah. ordeal to plan this stuff it's absolutely oh. ordeal yeah, it's it's grueling. I mean, he paddled out of the inlet, went down to the shoals. He was in it in and okay, as a Hobie guy, right? I can say this. Um, mad respect. He's a paddler. Like he You're he kidding. No, oh, he's a paddler. Oh so he went out of the inlet, down a couple miles in the ocean, and you know, it takes a lot of effort to stay in a position. Even even with pedals, it takes a lot of effort. So here he is following a bait ball. And and I don't wanna, you know, I don't want to steal his thunder. I hope you get him on the show. Um, but like the rod and the and the setup that he caught him on probably wasn't what he would have picked to catch this size of a fish, and it's a pretty epic story that the, that he landed it. So, I mean, with that tournament in mind, like going out there with that one rod and reel setup, how many baits? If you want to fish the the Chesapeake, whether it's uh, you know in our neck of the woods, Maryland, down to Norfolk, what are a handful of baits? Just generically, just to get a kid or a, a, you know an individual onto some fish. Well. You can't tell. I, I keep playing with them. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, for me, there's there's like basically three to four different kinds of things, right? There's, there's your uh, generic paddle tail. Uh, it doesn't have to be white, but it should be white um, for striper, especially. Um, so that this is a sashi shad. This is a like a Z man uh, diesel minnow. Okay. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily matter. There's a whole bunch of options out there. Again, like when I when I started fishing this area, there there weren't. You know, sassy shad was was probably about it. Now there's tons and tons of different options. I really like the Z-Mans because they're so durable. Like you can you can beat them up. Um, we don't have the bluefish that that most folks have in the Northeast, at least in my part of the bay in the mid bay. So I'm not I'm not burning through a lot of baits. But when I'm when I'm down on the eastern shore or when I'm down south, like I, I all I want is Z-Mans because um, it gets it gets annoying. That's a good um, tip. That's a real good tip. Or costly because they'll just bite the tail off. And so. These have a lot of action, um, a three to four inch Z-Man, um, somewhere between a, a quarter ounce and, and an ounce, um, depending on, on where you're trying to be in the water column, um, is all you need on a kayak. The other one, um, so that, that works for trolling, that works for casting. Uh, I think especially for folks that are new to the fishery, um, paddle tails are a lot easier to fish. Um, for me, I, I love the uh, like BKD or, or uh, some sort of uh, straight tail bait. Um, they get down a lot faster. Uh, especially, so I like, I love to fish bridges. I love to fish structure. I love to jig. Uh, and so for me, like BKDs, uh, Z-Mans make a straight tail, zoom flukes. Um, those kinds of things are, are, uh, are, are things that I use a lot. Um, this is the, the zoom fluke. Uh, it's just a little smaller. So if you're a bass fisherman, you're, you're pretty familiar with it. You don't have to rig it, um, belly out like I do. Okay. Uh, but it just get it gives it more action. Um, and so that's something that, that that's a tip for me, but, um, green or white is probably the best things to start with for stripers, at least in the Bay. Um, so, you know, things like chartreuse or lime truce or something like that. Um, they work really well. Um, the other thing that I, I think is a really good lure that everyone should have in a kayak is, is a floating plug. So this is, a uh, this will get down four to six feet. Um, that works really well for trolling around grass flats, trolling around edges. Um, there's deeper divers and things like that, but something like this or rattle trap, you'll catch a ton of stripers on. And then top water is the, is the fourth thing that I would say is that's, that's, those are the four things that I take with me on every trip. What size leader material, if you wanted to get a little bit more down the rabbit hole, would you use when you're using those bottom bumping baits around bridges, pylons, docks, things like that? Let's say if you're fishing for maybe more um, flounder, sheep's head, something on the bottom, I'm thinking where you're really going to need that heavier leader material. What do you usually go for? So those are kind of like two different things for me. If I'm, if I'm jigging, it's 20 to 40 
Okay. Probably 20, it's probably 30 pound mono or 30. If I'm around the bridge, it's probably mono. It's not our, our fluoro. Um, I'm cheap. I, I really love high seas, uh, mono. Um, it, the, the quattro, especially, it seems to be more abrasion resistance. Um, I love, uh, there's a couple of the fluoros that I like. There's a dia one that I like, dia one that I like. There's a, a couple others, but, um, 20 to 30 is what I'm going to jig with. If I'm going to bottom fish for sheep's head or tog, I, I personally love tog fishing in a kayak. Um, I'll, I'll send you a link to this article I wrote about kayak jig head fishing for tog. Um, it's kind of like bluegill fishing, except for they fight way, way better. Um, I love, I love that fishery. And so I'm fishing probably 40 pound for that. Um, kind of back to my shark joke earlier, it sucks sometimes cause it's really hard to break, but you're just grinding in the rocks, especially with a jig head and you're bouncing through it. You need something that's going to have more abrasion resistance. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, that's somewhere. Uh, so my kayak, every, every time I go out, I have something between 10 and 40 pound. And, and if it's especially, you know, especially scratchy bottom, I'll, I'll maybe I'll bring 50. How many rods are you generally bringing when you're going out? Generally it's three. three. Uh, if I'm, if I'm fishing an area where there's a lot of, um, a lot of different variation, I might bring a fourth rod, but for the most part, you know, three is more than enough. All, all spinning tackle. Are you ever going to use bait caster for more witching power? Uh, I don't necessarily go to bait casting for winching power. It's more about, um, um, comfort. So for me, I, I, I like to jig with a bait caster, um, because I can do a lot with one hand. So kayak fishing is everything's a trade-off. And so if you're, even as a Hobie guy, I have to use the rudder. And so if I'm fishing high current or if I'm fishing structure, like having one hand on the rudder is, is something that you really have to do a lot. And so being able to, to let out line and close, um, close that function, with one hand is something that's really nice with the bait caster. Um, so you don't even have to use one of those. Uh, you, you probably know this is John Skinner's made it really popular, but one of them's that, that has the, uh, the push button, right? Where you uh, can release. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember what it's called right now, but, um, those are really nice for bottom fishing. If you're, if you're jigging for flounder or something like that, but it, it doesn't, for me, it just, it, I can't seem to make that work for striper, but being able to like open it, click it with the, the handle. And then, you know, if I need to take up line, um, that's really nice for the bait caster. So unless I'm live lining or, or something I need, maybe more cranking power, most of the time I'm fishing light baits like this. So it's spinners, or if I'm, if I'm jigging, you know, something heavier like this, that's an ounce, um, I'm, I'm using a bait caster, but for us, you know, like, I think people always have this supposition that like, oh, I'm, I'm going saltwater fishing. I need these heavy rods. I fish the same tackle that you probably fish for smallmouth or you probably fish for largemouth. Um, you know, it's, it's rods that are probably rated eight to 17 pounds, um, medium, medium, heavy, things like that. Um, because again, you, you know, the kayak is the drag mm -hmm. and for us in the Bay, there isn't a lot of structure. So I, I fished all along the mm -hmm. Northeast I used to go Massachusetts a lot. And they have a lot more rocks. They have a lot more structure that you got to worry about getting broken off in. For us, it's mostly sand. So you, you can fish 10 pound braid um, in a medium rod and catch a 45, you know, 45 inch striper without really worrying about getting broken off. That's freaking, that's absolutely freaking nuts. So, so then like is striper fishing for the people that don't know, is it just year round in the bay or does it have the better like, like hot streaks? Like right now, for instance, is this a, an on time or off time to be able to go out and kayak fish? So, so this is a tough time for striper right now in July. I mean, the water's, the water's hot. Um, there are places where you can go out and jig. There's, there's, um, you know, in our area, there's, there's sort of the, um, the ubiquitously known places like the Bay bridge, there's the Eastern Bay, there's, there's, um, some places up North, um, where you can go out and jig stripers, right. And it, you can catch, um, somewhere between 14 and 30 inch stripers this time of year, but the water's so warm. And, and if you're, if you really didn't go out and try to catch quantity, um, it's probably not a good time to do it because, um, you're going to risk uh, that fish dying. And so like this year has been a little different because it's been cooler. I, I think, um, you know, the water's still cooler than it typically it would have been this time of year. So um, it seems like we have more fish around. We have, we have a better bite than we, we probably would have otherwise. Uh, but for me, I, I generally stop fishing for striper in the, the late mid to late June timeframe. And I focus more on snakehead. Um, and for me, striper is really a spring, fall and, and wintertime fishery. Uh, winter time actually being the best time to try to catch some of the trophy striper. Winter so, time and spring time. Mine is a snakehead because we're going to be getting to that bad boy here in a second. Is stri striper the primary sports fish people can expect to go out and catch right now? Is there a good flou flounder run, speckled trout, white perch? Like when does that usually get good? 
Yeah. So, so white perch are, you know, this is, this is fire season for white perch. Um, uh, that doesn't necessarily draw the crowds, uh, unless you're, mm -hmm. unless you really enjoy it, you know, they're a blast on light that goal. I encourage everybody to try it. Um, I, I think I, I just happen to have random stuff in my room here. Um, beetle spins, road runners, oh, really? Crappy small grubs. Stuff. Yeah. Uh, these small rattle traps, um, absolute knockout for, for white perch and you fish them all ultralight and, and they're, you know, they're, they're in the same, um, no genus. I'm not a, I'm not a biologist. So they're, they're, or whatever that, that word would be. Um, they're in the same family as stripers. So they, they eat a lot of the same ways. They eat a lot of the same types of things, just smaller. Um, so they can be really aggressive. They can be a lot of fun. You can catch them on top water. Um, and so I, I love white perch fishing. Um, and again, that's, that's probably what I would take home to fish. And so one of my favorite things to do in July and August is, is, uh, and even September and October sometimes is a uh, white perch fish and crab. So I'll take uh, hmm. topless crab traps out. Uh, I'll run them in a line. I'll go take some, some cast in the rip wrap and go back, check the traps, put the crabs in the, in the cooler, go catch some perch and just kind of repeat. And so I'll go home with a nice, a nice haul of white perch and crabs. And that's, that's one of my favorite things to do this time of year. If I'm not snakehead fishing. Um, otherwise, uh, speckled trout. So this kind of like red, red drum we were talking about earlier. Uh, it seems like every year, depending on if we've had a, a really cold winter or not, there's been a big fish kill. The speckled trout seems to get bigger, better, better and bigger every year. This year has been especially good. Um, I think I've caught, um, three or four specks over 25 inches. Um, nice. there's, there's been a lot of specks around. And so. Um, that's a fun fishery. Um, they don't necessarily fight like a striper, but, um, there's just something really cool about catching a big speck up here. Um, and I, you know, I think we're, we're not necessarily at the Northern range. If you, if, you know, if you remember your conversation with Brian, um, they've got a pretty good, our, our building speck fishery in ocean city. It seems like, um, Delaware Bay used to be a big fishery for speckled trout and weak fish. Um, seems like it's coming back, but, um, for us, you know, we can get some really big specks in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, as long as we didn't have a, a big fish kill and I've, I've seen, I haven't caught one, but I've seen specs over 30 inches and like, that's a pretty, that's, that's a pretty awesome. amazing fish to catch. That's so awesome. Like, again, like I know this is, uh, I keep harping on it, but I really like to see the Chesapeake Bay back. I mean, it's the largest estuary in the East coast. Like it'd really be nice to have all these other species there available. Plus I honestly, and this is my honest opinion. If you have more species, it, it, it decreases the pressure on one. Oh, for sure. And, and, and you asked me about flounder. I, I loved fishing for flounder. Um, we used to have a nice fishery in Cornfield Harbor down in the Potomac and, and, and then further south from there. And, um, you know, when I was younger, I would drive from Arlington and we would fish, you know, HRBT or CBBT or other, other places down there at night and then mm -hmm. like drive back and go to work the next day. I mean, we were crazy. Um, but we, it just seems like flounder. I don't know if it's the water warming or what it is, but it just, it just hasn't been what it used to be. Um, but you know, I have caught some nice fish over the years in the Chesapeake, um, generally not North of the mouth of the Potomac. Mm, that's good. One of, the, one of the things that I miss the most that we don't even ever talk about is croaker. Um, yeah, that is crazy. I remember growing up when we would go striper fishing and we would take a chart out when I was a kid and if the striper wasn't good, we'd go and try to catch some croaker to make up I, for the charter trip. And I yeah. love croaker fishing. Um, and when I, so we had a few years, um, probably like 2010, 2013, like we would go jigging for, for flounder and, and point lookout. And I mean, you would catch some horse croaker, like 14 to, to 16 inch croaker. And it was awesome. Right. And, um, now you can't catch them. I don't know if it's the netters. I don't know if it's a cycle. People talk about them being very cyclic, but, um, I miss them. They were awesome to fish for. I, the netters, I, I wonder, cause like I see, I, the one thing I hear from bass guys, they complain about all the netters and that they go up there and they see like a four or five pound bass stuck in the net and you wonder like why there's a problem. Um, yeah. and it's like, I, you know, maybe, maybe it's a multiple things, but I, I think that's something that we're probably should get into too, is with how bad is the netting? Is it, is it overdone? Is it overblown by people or is it a thing that should be talked about? Yeah, I think it's definitely something that should be talked about. Um, and it's, you know, it's, there's, there's a number of different fisheries for the netting and I, I'm, I'm probably not the most informed to, you know, I'll, I'll get attacked if I, if I say the wrong thing here, but how about observations, my observations are, um, the nets are indiscriminate and, and the bycatch, especially for weak fish and croaker and, um, spot and things like that, that, um, 
people don't necessarily think about as being something that's caught in nets that are that are being targeted for other fisheries, even speckled trout. Um, they get thrown out as bycatch. They don't get counted. They don't, you know, I, I think herring's probably similar. They, they don't necessarily get, make it to the commercial table. And so it's something that I don't think people realize how destructive that fishery is and, and how much of an impact it's having on other, other aspects of the ecosystem. So the fish no longer have that bait fish in their diet. They no longer have access to that. And so it just causes all these compound issues. Um, I think one of the other things that I've seen in my, in my time kayak fishing is pound nets. Um, I've seen gill nets. Um, and it just seems like they're, they're just so, um, I don't know, indiscriminate in that they don't, you know, you don't necessarily know what's going to swim into there. And so it just seems like something that as we're looking at conserving this resource, or we're looking at preserving it for, for generations to come, or we're looking at the health of the Chesapeake Bay, I think we really need to look at those fisheries and say like, is, does this make the most sense? Are, are there better ways to catch these fish? Are there more targeted ways of catching these fish? Um, I think the Northeast, right, they still have a commercial fishery for striper, but they, it seems like they've by and large gone to hook and line. Um, I, I think that is far less destructive. It's far more targeted. You know what you're catching. Um, I'd love to see the Chesapeake Bay do something that's, that's more targeted like that. Um, I'd love to see us consider putting, you know, slot limits on, on striper and things like that, where we're, we're really valuing those fish that are over, uh, over 35 to 40 inches and are producing those, those, um, those larger, um, uh, spawning class of, of, um, a fish. Um, I think we need to look at that because otherwise, you know, we're going to be back to a moratorium and, and people are, are going to realize like, Hey, we, we've taken too much out of this resource and we can't replace it. So between the Menhaden fishery down South in Virginia, uh, between the, the, the gillnet pound fishery and some of the trawlers, I mean, we're, we're really just asking for trouble. And then you add on top of that, you know, the quote unquote invasive species, like, like, you know, the blue catfish, things like that. Like it, it it's a lot and it's going to take away from this fishery a lot quicker than we think. Yeah. I mean, these fish are harassed every stage of their life. So, you know, I, 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 I loved going up to Boston and fish for them, but like up there, it's just like, holy cow, like 45 inch stripers are just getting slaughtered all summer. And really? They come back down the coast. They get crushed in New Jersey. They get crushed in North, um, in New York. They come around the bay. They get crushed in Virginia and in, in North Carolina. They try to spawn. You know the blue cats and this and, and other you know, largemouth bass are eating their young. Like we're we're killing them as they're now getting to to keeper size at the twenty inch limit. I mean these these fish are harassed their entire their entire life cycle. And I think I think it's unlikely that we're ever going to consider them purely a game fish. But I think we really need to look at valuing the the larger fish um, and the the way in which they contribute back to the resource that we all enjoy in a, in a larger way. And, I, and again, I, I think I mentioned this about the drum. Like, I don't think, you know, I don't think a 40 plus inch striper is really the best table fare. I, I, um, I've, I've, I've kept one or two, uh, in Massachusetts, um, not realizing that the, the guys were going to gill, uh, were going to gaff. I, I didn't even know you could gaff a striper, but in Massachusetts, apparently you can. That's crazy. Uh, so I went on a charter fishery there one time and, um, I went to reach down for its mouth and here came a hook and I was like, holy cow, I didn't, I, I didn't think you were going to, that's crazy. My hand, um, I would have let it go. And they're like, you paid all this money. I was like, yeah, I would have let it go. Um, so we, we ate it and, um, it really wasn't my favorite. Like, I don't, I don't see any reason to kill a fish that big again. Um, I'd much rather eat a 20 inch fish, uh, 22 inch fish. It's, it tasted way better. I really hope it's just education and it's just reteaching. Cause again, like a trophy fishery will give you, will give a community more money than if you just take. Um, and I really feel like if you start educating and we can get a trophy fishery back here, people want that to stay. Cause if that goes away, your money goes away. Cause the anglers are going to leave. Hey, I hear stories. I hear stories of catching, you know, 40 inch plus fish and on top water in Eastern Bay. I hear, you know, all these legends um, from the hook and liner or other people that I've, I've, I've become uh, friends with either through the tidal Potomac group or CCA or, or snag line. And I hear these stories about the fishery that the Chesapeake used to be. And I sure would love to see it. I'd love for my, my, my son to see it. I'd, I'd love for us to be able to get back to that historic level of being able to catch that kind of fish. Now we're, now we're excited about 20 some inch fish. And it used to be like, from what they say, we used to be able to catch 30 inch fish all mm -hmm. summer. We just, we just don't have that kind of fishery anymore. Um, and one of those things that I, I think they talk about during the moratorium was the bluefish. 
Um, I love catching big bluefish. I mean, going up to, to Jamaica Bay, we didn't, we didn't talk about this earlier, but one of the cool things about the kayak community, when I, when I got into it, um, there were these sort of like, um, jamborees or, or, um, they, they were tournaments, but they really weren't about the money. They weren't like the, the fish and paddle group now that, um, that is really more akin to a normal fish fishing tournament that people are familiar with. It was like, Hey, you might win first place and catch the biggest of these three different species. And all you're going to get is a certificate. People were fighting for that certificate because it was that notoriety it was that, it was that accomplishment. So it wasn't about the prizes. It wasn't about the, um, it wasn't about the tournament itself, but like Jamaica Bay and its heyday had 350 plus kayakers all Damn. camping together, all camping together at Floyd Bennett field. Um, and so when I went up there in 2008 or 2009 for the first time, and I saw this like community of all these guys that are fishing and they're like, Hey man, throw this over here. You're going to catch a fish. And everybody was super helpful. I was like, this is amazing. This is something that I want to get behind. And, uh, that year just happened to be like the weak fish year up there. And so they're catching weak fish, you know, gray trout, 35 inch plus 37 inch, 38 inch <laughs> oh, that is so cool. on like 10 inch hoagies and like, where the hell am I? Like, what is this fishery? What are these fish even? Um, so I, I was blown away. And then I, you know, I caught, I caught some 30 inch bluefish or 30 plus since bluefish. And I, you know, I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know what to do with the kayak. It's got teeth. It's got razor blades. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was like, that was a learning experience for me. And I was, it was crack. Like all I could think about from that point on, was like, I got to get back to J Bay next May. I got to go to J Bay. Um, and so after like a couple years of that, we, we decided like, Hey, we need something like this in our area. And so we, we, we founded the Chesapeake Bay Kayak Association and we, we started our own tournament. We ran that for six or seven years and it was really, it wasn't about, again, it wasn't about the prizes, although we had amazing cra uh, captain's bags. You know, if you were, if anybody happens to be listening, that was a sponsor. I mean, you guys are amazing. We had amazing uh, sponsors back then. And so we had a lot of, we had a lot of really cool local companies that donated. We had BKD and specialized baits and, and a whole host of others that they were all local guys that were making baits. And they were all about the kayaks fishing scene and saying, Hey, we, we think you guys are, you know, an interesting group. We, we want to make sure that we're supportive. And so they gave us all sorts of stuff and it was awesome. Um, and it was really for us, it was about trying to foster that community and, and try to make an event that, that we could have, uh, folks that came out and said, Hey, like, I'm new to kayak fishing. I want to learn how to fish the bay. And it was like, oh, cool. Like, hey, he lives near you. He'll take you out. Um, and it was great. And and so we we ultimately, you know, the guys that founded it, my, myself and uh, John Foley and Brian Rusk, um, we all kind of hit different phases in life. They 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 were close to retirement. I had I had uh, gotten married and had a child, and so we just we didn't have the time that we needed to mm -hmm. to run that tournament. So we we kind of decided to move on. Uh, but I'm sure there's, there's folks that maybe will listen to this that, that missed this tournament. And, uh, it was, it was a great scene. It was all, it was, again, it was all about the community. And so, um, I think that's been one of the things that I would say for folks that are, that are interested in kayak fishing, it's a, it's, it's a different scene than bass fishing probably in that, um, you know, there, there are folks that'll take you out buddy boating and there's people that'll let you, uh, to ride with them, you know, be that backseat cast. They'll show you their spots. They'll show you their techniques. They'll show you how they break down water. Um, but it's, you know, it's always a competitive edge. Kayak guys, for the most part, at least, at least uh, my generation of folks are, we're all about taking people out on the water. I mean, fish move around, uh, patterns change, but like anybody that wants to go out and learn about the fishery, learn about how to kayak fish, uh, for the most part, like I love to take people, other people, um, I'm sure in our area, we continue to love to take people. And um, it's just one of those things. It's, it's, it's a different vibe than in your normal fishery. It's just, it's just a lot of fun. I think this is the one of the benefits of COVID is how many more people now are involved in fishing because of because of kayaking, maybe COVID, maybe both. You know, people are more experiencing. You don't need a hundred thousand dollar bass boat. Um, you you don't need a big you know bronze whaler to get out there and have success and fall in love with it. And you create these kayak uh, communities, whether it's the Chesapeake Bay Association or Northern Virginia Kayak Bass Association, and you can develop that community around fishing and fall in love with this sport which is, which is really awesome. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, I, I've made some really good friends through that, through Snagline and through some of these kayak fishing tournaments. And, um, I, I think, you know, I've taken a number of new anglers out. I've taken people from work. I've taken folks from the forum. And, um, I think everybody has their own thing that they like about kayak fishing, but there's just something about being on the water in the water and trying to fight a fish and struggling through that. And, um, you know, I, I think this day and age, you know, I, I don't, it's not a knock. This is, this is certainly not a knock. I mean, I'm, I'm really, 
I'm really supportive of the kayak industry in general. But like when we started out, we had, you know, maybe a Scotty rod holder. Like that was, that was your accessory. Like we, you know, we were stealing milk crates from gas stations. We were putting PVC with zip ties. We were, we were MacGyvering things with duct tape and PVC. And um, nowadays, you know, there's an accessory for everything. There's a company that makes something the accessories and things are just amazing. Like it, it really is amazing. Like some of the things that these guys are coming up with. Um, and so I think guys that, that are new to the sport, they get fixated on these things. They watch these videos and like, I need to get this, this accessory. You don't need it. Like you need one rod, a bag full of lures, and you can have a blast. Like you, you really can. You don't, you don't need more than that. Um, and if you do, um, ask somebody to take you out. And I guarantee you, like, we'll, we'll be pumped to give you a rod. We'll give you pumped to give you tackle. Um, because probably we went through it at some point and we bought way more than we needed. Uh, and we'd love to just share that experience with somebody that wants to get into the sport. Um, I had the pleasure during COVID of taking one of my coworkers and his son out that were new to kayak fishing. Oh, awesome. I took him snakehead fishing and took him striper fishing, took him speckled trout fishing. Um, and I think it was just, it was just really cool to see him and his son. Like I had a tandem Hobie at the time, like to get into figuring out like, okay, like how are we going to negotiate being on a kayak? Because we're father and son and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to cast here. You're trying to cast there. And, uh, it was just funny kind of watching them level out. And then, they got into a rhythm, they caught some snakehead, they caught some trout, they caught some striper and they're hooked. They went out and bought kayaks, they bought a trailer, like they're all in. And it, now it's become something that they do as a family. And uh, I don't know, I'm just, I'm really happy to see that because, um, you know, I think, I think our Chesapeake Bay is, is an amazing resource, as you said. Uh, I think it can be better. I think we've mm -hmm. got a long way to go. I think there's a lot of conservation that, that, that we need to improve. Um, there's a big fish kill going on right now north of the bridge. It's that time of the year. It seems to happen every year. Um, I think there's things is that we as this population around around the Chesapeake Bay could be doing better at. And I'd love to see the bay come back to some of its historic levels. I'd love to see us have this big resource for generations to come. And I just think that there's something there's something unique about experiencing it from a kayak as opposed to a boat. Sure, you know, in a boat you can see far more of the bay than we can, but like you're in the bay in a kayak. Mm -hmm. You're 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 in 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 level with the fish, and it's it's just a different experience. And so, like for me, I love going to the eastern shore. Like I love going down to the lower eastern shore and seeing what what I view is what the bay probably looked like, you know, 20 plus years ago, where there is all this grass, there is all this clean water, this gin clean green water, and I can see, you know, four to eight feet down. I can see sometimes more than that on a clean day, and it's it's amazing some of the, some of the times how clean that water is. And I just wonder what it looked like before, um, you know, all the things that we've done to this place and all the oysters and things that we've removed from this environment. I just wonder what the Bay would have been like back then. And I, you know, I, I wish I could go back in time and fish before, you know, back in the John Cook days, I would love to have gone striper fishing. Yeah. And I really think, and we're going to, and guys, don't worry about, it, we're trying to get somebody on from um, Chesapeake Bay uh, Association. Somebody talk about the oysters and the grass. Cause I, again, yeah. I know get I beat, I beat Dave Sikorsky, get, get Dave. Dave. Yeah. Cause like it growing up where, and this is just more of me of a bass guy, but knowing like how important aquatic vegetation is. And I've gone to the St. The St. John's before and I fished there and to see how the pesticides have just completely changed it. And like, it's void of grass. And I know like the Potomac river is very special because of it. And people don't understand unless you're an outdoors person, like there is a balance to nature and you don't mess with that. You don't, you, you need the aquatic vegetation you need the oysters to help filter and create this ecosystem. And it starts from the ground up. And when you see the Potomac river or the bay or any contributors, to the bay, you got to make sure that stuff is there. And if it's not, yeah, your dock might look great, but there's a ripple effect of that. And so yeah. again, it's just educating the public. There's a, there's a, you know, not, not just to tell you all the people you should interview, but there's another captain that you should talk to Mike Starrett, um, who's made, a who's made a, a pretty cool fishery out of the snakehead, um, on the Potomac. And he'll talk to you about the underwater grasses. He'll talk to you about the, uh, the pickerel grass and other, other habitat that the snakehead are living in. And, um, he kind of opened my eyes to the importance of underwater vegetation. But I don't know if you remember this, um, you know, when I was, when I was more of a, um, freshwater guy, like the zebra mussels and like, mm -hmm. holy cow, like the zebra mussels are going to ruin our fishery, like all this stuff. And then everyone in the great lakes were like, wait, the, the water's it's cleaner. Clear. Is that crazy? Um, <laughs> um, and I, I, I don't know. I was kind of rooting for like, Hey, maybe, maybe those zebra mussels will make it down here and we'll, we'll get some of that filtration that, um, that we should have had back when the oysters were here. 
And wouldn't that be a good thing? Um, yeah, it, but what are all invasives bad invasives? And I think that's the the hypothetical question I pose is like it, with even with Odenkirk, it's like hydrilla is technically invasive, but it will grow and it will help other aquatic vegetation out. So, and, and again, like so, Virginia Department of Fish and Game, you guys don't know, like they approve of hydrilla. They they think it's it's important because it'll grow where other places won't and it'll help out the other vegetation. And so you think about the zebra mussel um, and I think gobies up in the Great Lakes is a whole other yeah. conversation, but that's exploded the place. Are there different things that we can do to help? And I'm not saying, and I'm not condoning just so I don't get completely killed by YouTube saying that you should go dump this stuff in there, but it's more of a bigger conversation about how do we help the fisheries the way they are? I mean, if you look at DC, there are rumors of people dumping pollution in that thing like every other day. Well, what the hell can we do to actually help fix these fishes? And if this will work, then I don't know. Yeah, I think I think Australia is probably a good model for why we can't play, um, you know, in, environmental stewards. Um, you know, I think I think I think we proved, um, you know, adding a certain number of of creatures to the environment really really didn't work out. You're talking um, about the toads. You're talking about the, the rabbits. rabbits, the toads. <laughs> I mean, you you pick the dingoes. Um, yeah, I, I just I just think it's a it's a dangerous game, and um, I I think for the most part it's the um, you know like. I think having talked to to, to John before, um, the snakeheads really aren't doing as much harm as folks thought. I, I loved fishing for them when I lived in Virginia. I love fishing for them now in Maryland as they've continued to spread into new environments. Um, I got I got really into fishing for them on Blackwater about four years ago, and um, now I can't even go to Blackwater. I can't find a place to park. I mean, it's nuts how much um, how many snakehead fishermen, how many new kayakers and things that that they've really driven. And I think. I think as, as you were mentioned earlier, like about stripers, you know, snakehead are going to hit that inflection point of we're going to realize there's an economic value of what they're providing to some of these, some of these areas that haven't experienced these fisheries. I mean, I hear stories about blackwater being an amazing freshwater fishery for bass. I think people talk about back Bay and Virginia as being an amazing fishery mm -hmm. for bass. If you talk to Corey Ruth or some of those folks down there, um, I think lefty even made that a big scene back in the day. Um, I think snakehead for blackwater is just, blown that place up. I mean, I, I, I go down there now, there's new bar, new restaurants, new bars, new tackle shops, new new industry that's down there that that is entirely probably supported now by the snakehead fishery. And you want to talk about cult following. Have you ever gone to a snakehead like Facebook group? Good God. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole different scene. Uh, it's a whole different fishery. It's a whole different group. It's a whole different segment of population that, that's now fishing for snakehead. And it's pretty cool, honestly, of like, it's now drawn, you know, all these different folks into this fishery and, um, stick out of a lot to like, depending on what your thing is. Like, if you like explosive topwater strikes, if you like fish that fight hard, if you like fish that taste good, like there's a lot of things to like in snakehead. Um, for me in Virginia, like I fished for snakehead in a lot of terrible places. Like I've got, I'll, I'll, I'll try to find it, but I've got pictures of me and Roach's run and like, you look behind me and like, I'm basically fishing in a sewer. Like there's trash everywhere. Like there's a culvert behind me and I'm crushing snakehead. Like I, I, I used to go there a lot. Uh, I'm sure there's still snakehead there. So I'm sorry if anybody that's fishing there now and thinks it's like your secret spot, apologize if I'm blowing it up. Um, but like there's big blue cats back there. I, I'm back to, you know, back to fish stories. I caught a, like a 38 inch blue cat on six pound test on like a ultralight on a beetle spin. Damn. Took me like an hour to catch that thing. Um, I can't believe you in, landed it. Wow. In like July. I mean, it was hot. I was like, why is this fish in six feet of water? Uh, I just happened to be trolling from one place to another. And, you know, that's the cool thing about a kayak. You can't go fast. You might as well troll. So you should always have a line in the water and just happen to be this blue cat ate it. But I, I mean, I've, I've caught a lot of snakehead in weird places because that's one of those things that they, they kind of defy some of the logic of fishing is that they're in water that you, you wouldn't otherwise find fish in. Um, I, I think I brought up Mike Starr earlier. Like he always tells you, like they're 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 back in the woods with the goats. Um, I won't say it how he says it, but uh, they're they're way back there, and so cast where you wouldn't think a fish would be. And sometimes that's that's the snakehead spot. Like you're in three inches of water, and it looked like a log, and it was a snakehead. Um, and so it's it's been a cool fishery. It's been something that I I look forward to every year. You know that April to October time frame, and. Um, I, I, I think they're enriching our, our fishery, honestly. Oh, I, I, 
Yeah, I, I agree with it. And again, it's like you said it, I said it to Odenkirk. It's like at some point, it, there's going to be this tipping point where all of a sudden you're going to have to start protecting them because people, it, there's such a draw. How many hashtags about just catching water dragons there are now compared to a couple of years ago? I'd love to see that analytic for that trending because it, it's growing big time. I, I might, you know, I might be in the minority. I might get booed for this, but like, I, I dislike catching the bass. I dislike catching a tidal Potomac bass or a tidal bass at this point because I, uh, I don't think they fight as hard. I don't think they're as exciting. Like I'm like, oh man, I caught a five pound bass and I, I'm trying to shake it off because I want to cast again for a snake. Oh, yeah, like, okay. I, yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. But like, it, it's like, what would you rather do? Is like, if you want just the pure fun of like catching something that's going to pull you to go to the snakehead. It's. I think the biggest thing is the money behind the tournament scene. I mean, yeah. let's not kid ourselves. Like the reason ICAST is so big is because of the bass market and how much money is behind BFL and BASSS. That's yeah. why Smallwood is just smashed with tournaments. Um, and I think that's what's so funny is because it was the bass people. I, I I'm going to say that probably bitched the most when Snakehead first got in there about that they were going to eat all all the bass. It's going to destroy everything. And again, like poor Odenkirk. My God, some of the stuff they, he they said, made it better, man. Honestly, uh, yeah, they have. They have, and, and we were wrong or, or people were wrong about what they were going to do to the place. And then to me, my thing is at that point, if they're not a negative, when do we declare? Because bass aren't even native to most of these places. They're not. They're invasive too. Yep. Smallmouth are invasive to the or, Upper Potomac. Or introduced, I think is the, yeah, the nice way yeah. they say invasive. It, yeah, introduced. So why not have the conversation now about putting a limit on them, putting a slot limit on them and start preserving them and just being like, hey, they're here to stay. Yeah, I, I honestly, as a as a hook and line or as a as a rod and reel kind of guy, like I would love to see that because uh, a number of the places that I I really enjoyed snakehead fishing have just been crushed with bow fishermen. There, there's no regulation. They go out, they kill hundreds of snakehead a night, and mm. um, you know they're spotlighting them. It's 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 fish in a barrel for them, and um, they I I think. You know, they, they feel like based on things that they've seen in the news, things that they, they have been told that they're doing their civic duty to the God and country to, to rid the scourge of the snakehead. Um, that's what it started with. Now they're selling them. Um, I, I think that, uh, as they continue to sell them and the state realizes that there's, there's such a market, mm. I think there's a, there's a grocery store near me that's selling them now for like 20 bucks a pound filleted. I mean, that's, that's high dollar. That's, that's like halibut level, um, that they're going to realize that there's, there's, a, there's a bigger fishery here. There's a bigger market for them. And, uh, and maybe at that point we'll hit the, hit the point where they're going to say, Hey, let's, let's limit some of this. Let's make uh, a bigger, bigger, uh, economic stance on this. Because as I said with Blackwater, I mean, just, just the businesses in general. Um, but you know, there's a ton of local bait manufacturers and tackle shops. There's a bunch of, uh, restaurants that are all benefiting from the boon that this that these snake have brought. And like you said, it's water that would not have anything in it to begin with. Like it, it's dead water that that you now can catch a fish of a lifetime possibly on. And I, and I have to ask you this with your fly fishing history. Have you caught one on fly yet? So I've tried. I, um, I have tried and tried. And I, um, I got to say as a, as a guy that, that has now had the crack of saltwater kayak fishing, um, my tolerance for snags and uh, <laughs> kayak kayak fly fishing just in general um so you know fly fishing's hard uh fly fishing in a kayak where there's all sorts of things for your line to catch on there's all sorts of challenges um it's tough and so i have not caught one on a fly i've had strikes i've had fish on i have lost them and um time and time again i just default back to to spinning gear casting gear because um Honestly, snakehead are actually really challenging to catch on hook and line. You'll see stories online of like, oh my gosh, I crushed them. Like they're really finicky. Like they'll be on for 15 minutes and you can't miss and then it's done. And, um, you know, some days you're, 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 uh, you're crushing them. And then other days it's like, you, you don't even believe they're snakehead in that, in that river because you can't find them. Um, and so they're, they're kind of like, they're really challenging for me as a, as a finicky fish, but, I want to catch one on a fly. I, I think um, that's that that remains a goal for me. But um, if you catch, I don't know if you've caught one on top water yet. But if you if you catch a snake on like a, a soft frog top water, or like a buzz uh, buzz frog or, or something that's um, that you're going to get that interactive strike and you're going to see them come behind with this submarine sort of thing. Like mm -hmm. you can't go back from that. Like, All right. You, yeah. You, you're going to go like, why would I pull out a fly rod? Like kayaking's hard enough. Like 
I want to catch more snakeheads. And so um, it's really hard to want to bring a fly rod sometimes. I have never caught one when I was trying to target them. But when I'm pre-fishing for a tournament or something else like that, oh my God, I could load the boat. I don't know why. I, I don't, I've caught... I caught one that was close to 10 pounds on a rattle trap and I caught another one on a swim jig during a tournament, but yeah, never... rattle traps, rattle traps are good. I, uh, I mean, you know, I don't know, I don't know how I had props here, but like the it's black like frog, Oh the yeah, black frog for me is, um, it's pretty good. I, I caught one that was like 35 inches, uh, last year in black water and, um, it inhaled it. I had to cut it out of it when I got home. Like I now, couldn't even see the frog. Are you using spinning tackle when you go for snakeheads or are you using more bait caster, heavier stuff like, like bass gear so you can hit them harder? Um, I'm probably weird. I probably, I, I think I use lighter gear than most folks like this, this whole frog rake thing or whatever people talk about is like a heavy bait caster. Um, I don't see a need for it. Um, I think that one of the things that snakehead fishing, um, has really taught me that's different than bass is like, don't set the hook immediately yeah like let them eat it wait and then you know count drop your rod tip and then set the hook like it is not natural to me um you know anybody that that has gone fishing for me with snake head will, will hear me curse from across the water <laughs> of like i can't do this um and i have to mentally stop myself from from setting the hook is uh is really that you know bow weight snap um that really has increased my hook ratio and so i um yeah, I really, I really think that helps. Um, yeah. So a last thing I really have to touch on this Hobie pedal drive. If somebody's in the market for a kayak, how, how much of a game changer is it to be fishing with, with a pedal drive system, whether it is the Hobie Mirage drive or something else compared to just paddling? I wish I'd written down how many kayaks I had to be able to tell you that, um, my opinion is pretty informed. Um, so I, I started out with a redfish 12. Um, if you, if you guys come to snag line, I'm, I'm redfish 12 on there because I was like, what the hell is a kayak fishing forum? I don't, I'm not creative. I don't know what my forum name is going to be. So I just, I wrote the name of my kayak. Um, and so everyone's like, oh, you really must really into redfish. No, like that was just the name of my kayak. I had a heritage red, redfish 12 as my first kayak. Um, I went on to have a, an ocean kayak tried in 13, a ride 135, like a tarpon 120 like i've had i've had a number of kayaks it's a huge game changer um the the breaking point for me is uh, i fished cbbt uh, a couple times with joe that we were talking about earlier come on fish and uh you know we're we're three three and a half miles from from the beach out by the first island tog fishing and i you know i'm paddling out there he's talking on a cell phone drinking coffee eating a sandwich and i'm huffing and puffing and dying trying to get out there and just trying to hold my position he's catching fish we go to lake anna the next week it's sleet um you know it's 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 miserable and he's he's sitting there with a nice cup of coffee drinking it talking to his wife on the phone and i'm like i i just want to be more comfortable right like mm. I, I just want to be more comfortable um but what i realized is like even while he was doing that he's twitching his he's twitching his rod he's adding action to what he's trolling um he's got two rods in the water i have no rods in the water he's catching fish all day and i'm struggling so I bought a, I bought it my first Hobie in like 2010. Um, and, and it was a Revo 13, uh, it's probably my favorite kayak ever because, uh, I think we were talking about this earlier about going offshore. Um, it was a really uncomfortable kayak. Your, your butt was in the water all day. You had to, you had to take the, the, um, the scupper plugs out if you're going to fish what rough water, because if you took a wave, you're just sitting in a bowl of water. And so. Um, you just ended up in this position where like, well, I'm going to tolerate water coming in because at least water will come out. And so you ended up there with like wet butt and itchy butt and it, it was terrible. Um, but it was super seaworthy. Like you, you were, you were glued to the water. You, uh, you could fish in any, any sort of conditions. And so I got that kayak and it just opened a whole new world of fishing for me. It opened up being able to fish structure, being able to jig bridges and current. So I think that's one of the other things that you guys don't, you don't probably deal with in the freshwater side is like, for us, like fish really bite in salt water when the currents run. And so be, especially striper. And so they're ambush predators, they're lazy. Um, they're going to hide behind something that they can sit there and not have to swim. And they're going to wait for meals to come by them. They're just going to sit there and slurp down things that come by. And so you need to be there when the water's moving. Well, if you're in a pilot kayak, you got to paddle up, get near the piling, take a cast. And by the time you're in, the, in a fishing position, you know, you're, you're now back 20, 30 yards and now you got to paddle back up. 
Um, for me, you're just sitting there effortlessly sort of like pedaling, which is kind of like walking. Um, you know, I used to get off the water and my arms were cooked. Well, now I'm, I'm on the, I'm in the pedal drive. I'm not really expending as much effort. It's kind of like walking. You can, you know, I, I say 22 miles earlier, like that's a big deal, but like, it's, it's like walking, you know, you're not, you're not necessarily going fast, um, but you can go at a steady pace for a long time um, without expending as much energy. So like you can hold position, you can fish structure and you can have your hands free to be able to jig, or you can actually have two or three rods out and actually be able to fish them and, and deal with fish. Whereas in a kayak that you're pedaling or paddling, um, you're sort of at the mercy of the wind, the turn, the currents and the fish, and, uh, it can be a challenge. That's, that's really important. Cause I know people that want to go, and I'm, I'm not against just like trying to be budget, but I also think about being safe and maybe going with that little bit more expensive thing to have the ability to paddle, to pedal, uh, maybe actually be safer on saltwater specifically where you're dealing with currents that are ripping. I, you know, I think if you're going to fish structure, like if you're going to fish the bridge, like J the, the Chesapeake Bay bridge, I mean, I can, I can send you pictures of me in, in a paddle kayak and I'm, I'm crushing fish live lining. Like I'm, but I'm, I'm, I've got a foot on the piling. Like I'm cheating. I am putting in something that's, 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 in, that's, um, slowing down me getting washed out. Um, uh, with a Hobie, I'm jigging. I am, I'm fishing a completely different style that I would not, that would not be accessible to me if I wasn't in a paddle kayak, uh, or pedal kayak. Um, and I'm fishing places like, especially around the Bay bridge up here, which, you know, for folks that aren't from this area, it's combat fishing some days. I mean, there are a lot of charter boats out there. There's a lot of recreational fishermen, but like as a boater, you just can't get as close to the pilings as I can. Like there, there's double spans where I'm inside of it and you can't get a cast where those fish are. And so I'm, I'm able to sit there on top of the fish and just catch things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do because I'm able to do that safely because I'm pedaling or I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm in a kayak and I can, I can navigate those tight areas. So I think, I think that's just something that opens up a different fishery once you do that, but you can definitely catch fish in a paddle kayak. I mean, you can, you can definitely find ways to maximize your time in the water and pick different fisheries to do that. Um, I think one of the things that paddle paddle kayakers like to do that scares me is anchor. Um, as a, hmm. as a Hobie guy, I'm not really an anchor, uh, anchor person. I, I don't think bass fishermen are generally anchor people, but, uh, when folks come to saltwater, they, they have this, this idea of like, oh, I'm going to go to this spot. I'm going to anchor, I'm going to cast, or I'm going to drop bait. And they don't realize that when the current turns on, like that anchor can be really unsafe. And so there's, there's a number of YouTube videos or articles out there. I'd encourage everybody to look it up about how to create a detachable anchor. You put a buoy on it so you can, you can unclip it quickly you can ditch it and then be able to recover it so that you have a buoy to, to come back to. Um, but it's something that people that are new to the sport sometimes don't think about and they'll tie it off to a side handle. They end up being like perpendicular to the current they'll dip under and, and that can be a really bad day and things that people aren't prepared for. And so you just got to think through some of those types of trade-offs and, and make sure you're making smart choices. That is, that is really good. Cause it's just the devil in the detail about, you know, your life preserver, your equipment going out there, where are you, are you going to use an anchor? What are the pros and cons of that? And the pros and cons could also be like, you know, really ruin your day. Yeah. Um, well, so if anyone wants to buy a Hobie kayak, well, where can they get one? So I, I, I'm on the Hobie fishing team, uh, shameless plug, uh, backyard boats in Annapolis is who sponsors me, but they're, um, one of the cool things that that's really happened in the past few years since I've been uh, part of the sport is there are so many more kayak dealers out here. And so it used to be like, there was Annapolis, uh, I mean, sorry, there was a Appomattox kayak down in, um, down in Richmond and then in Appomattox that, that was one of the big brand names around here in Virginia and central Virginia. Um, there was backyard boats and that was about it. Nowadays, you've got Delaware paddle sports. You've got ocean. Um, as you heard on Brian's, um, discussion with you, you've got Dean up there in ocean city. Um, there's so many more kayak dealers out there to be able to get, and there's so many more kayak manufacturers. Um, hope you might not like me saying this, but like, I think competition is good. I think seeing native and seeing, um, uh, some of the other brands Jackson that have brought pedal drives to bear has really had them step up their game. So we have things like reverse, we, you know, which seems crazy for people that, that aren't, are new to the sport that, what do you mean you didn't have reverse? Well, we really didn't need it in the saltwater. Like you're, you're not bass fishing where you're running into a log, or you're running ashore. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just able to move around. So like reverse was never something that I thought I needed. Now I have it, especially when I go snakehead fishing, I'm, I'm appreciative that I have it. Um, there's things like the 360 drive, which is cool. 
Um, I would think that that would be neat if you were a, a freshwater fisherman. We don't really have a need for it in saltwater. Um, for me, I'm I'm maybe a I'm maybe an old man at this point where I'm like I don't want any more complexity than a mirage drive. Um, so all these different 180s and 360s, it, it's just more things to break. Um, I, I I think that simpler is better, and I um. I don't have a boat for a reason because I'm horrible at maintenance. I'm lucky if I if I even hose off my Mirage drive. Um, so I've gotten pretty good at fixing things. Uh, I think there's a couple of us that have suffered some catastrophic Mirage drive failure where like you'll break a shaft off or something and you're four miles offshore and there's a storm coming. Um, those days suck, but you just you just figure out how to deal with it. You know, you always have a paddle or something as backup, uh, and so you just got to be prepared for that. But um, you know, if you're into the market, you're looking for a, a kayak, do your research. The, you know, again, like when I started kayak fishing, there were hardly any, any resources you could draw upon. Kayak Angler Magazine, uh, On the Water Magazine, both have great buyer's guides. So you can go out, look at, at some of the pros and cons, and get some idea of uh, the different manufacturers and things that, um, that maybe are, are better, better suited to the fishery that you want to be part of. Uh, I think if you're going to fish open water, you're going to fish uh, things where you're going to be like where we are in the bay, where you're going to fish shallow flats. It's a lot of the kayak fishing that I do where you're in four to eight feet water water, and you might hit up a sandbar. Um, the Hopi's pretty amazing in that you can push your foot forward, the fins tuck against the, the bottom of the kayak, and you can go in two inches of water and not have to worry about it. You can glide over that, you can paddle over it, and then start pedaling again. Um, that's pretty neat. So having to pull your, you know, your propeller up on some of the other models. Um, so Is I, there a I, specific I, brand that you would suggest, sorry to cut you off there, but I, I know like we were talking before the show and I, I was thinking about a PA 14, if somebody wanted to specifically fish the bay more, um, which model Hobie would you suggest? So generally speaking, um, my, my recommendations for a bay kayak are 12 feet or longer, uh, and no more than 34 inches wide. And so for me, the PA is, uh, it hits some of that, but it's, it's, it's wider. Um, it's taller off the water than some of the other models. Um, if you're going to do open water and you're going to cover distance, the, um, what used to be the adventure, the Revo 16 was one of the best open water kayaks. It was fast. It was sleek, uh, similar to like the tarpon 160, um, or open water, um, like ocean kayak. Um, you could cover a lot of ground in those, but the, the trade-off is you lost that primary stability. They were very narrow. And so you felt tippy. Um, I think the, the best for me, the best in breed right now is the Outback, uh, especially the redesigned Outback. It's got, it's got sort of a pontoon hull, so it's got a lot of stability. You can get up and stand up in it. Uh, that's, I think that's something that bass fishermen really like to be able to, to flip and pitch jigs, like to be able to sight fish. Uh, for me, I love being able to stand up in top water. Like it's just oh, yeah. that's, that's top water sitting down. It's just sort of awkward. Uh, and so being able to like hit a flat, find some fish, pop up and be able to sort of survey and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to topwater fish now. Like that's one of my favorite things to do. And so I have a, I have an outback and, um, I really enjoy like the new flat deck and being able to stand up and, and, uh, sight fish is, is something that I really, I really enjoy. And so I would say, you know, if you're getting in, if you're looking at the sport, I think people joke about like, you know, buy once, cry once, um, I didn't do that. I bought a bunch of different kayaks uh, and and try to figure out sort of how to how to be cheap. My first kayak was from a demo fleet, so it was like two hundred dollars. It had a hole in it. I had to learn how to patch a kayak. Um, I caught fish in it, um, but I was miserable. Like I mean, I was miserable compared to people in Hobies. And so um, I, I I looked back then and seen people in like two thousand eight that had a Hobie, and I was like, "There's no way I'm ever going to have that." After four years of kayak fishing, I was like, "I'm ready to invest." Um, so once I got a Hobie, I've, I've never gone back, um, to a different kayak. I've, I've, I've had other kayaks along the way, but I've always had a Hobie. And, um, for me, it's just really opened up a whole different fishery. And so I would say if you stick to that rule, 12 feet or longer, 34 inches or less, I think you'll be okay in finding something that, um, tracks well. Um, so you're going to find days on, even as a paddle, pedal kayaker or a paddle kayaker where the wind, wind just really causes you problems, right? You're, you're unable to paddle in a straight line. You're, you're constantly doing this. You're constantly, um, expending energy and trying to just hold position. And so, um, the, the 10 foot kayaks that seem to like, I don't know what it is with the, the theme with kayak fishing these days. I think it's honestly, it's the influx of the freshwater bass fishery guys, but yeah. like, <laughs> the Johnny boats, the, the, the predators, these, these different these different models that are like 10 feet long and they're like 36 inch plus wide like the new canoes 
they're really not great open water boats. And so if you're in a river or you're in a pond, you're in a lake, that's great. Like though there, there's, there's great utility in being able to stand up in those. There's, there's probably, you know, a lot of primary stability in those boats. You've got a lot of deck space to be able to put things like that makes sense. But bringing those things to the bay sometimes, um, that can be a really rough day if, mm. if you're not ready to paddle that. And so I just think for us, uh, either an Outback, uh, a Revo, something like that, that, um, that you're, you're able to cover miles in. Um, hopefully you're able to interview John, but he just paddled the entire Chesapeake Bay in an Outback. That's uh, so like, it's, it's something that, uh, you can really cover a lot of ground in. Like I can, I can sustain four to five miles an hour in my Outback. No problem. I can do that for hours. Um, and so that's just something that you just get in the rhythm. Um, you know, nowadays it's like turbo fins or whatever we used to call them. Um, I don't feel like they have the same resistance as they used to. Like it used to be really, um, really more um, effort expending to, to be able to push those. Now the, with the bearings and things that they've tweaked with the Mirage Drive, like it, it's it's more effortless than a recumbent bike. Wow. Like in, a low, in a low gear. Um, it used to be sort of the joke was like, um, it's kind of like a mountain bike, you know, low gear, less resistance, more reps. Um, now it seems to be like it's the same amount of reps, but you're going a little faster. So they've, they've definitely done some improvements over the years. And I, I think that comes back to that competition thing I said earlier. Mike, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to keep you, uh, all night, but w if people want to follow you, like w what are your socials? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm a horrible social media poster. <laughs> I, I, I have a, I mean, again, Hobie, I apologize. I'm supposed to be posting more. Uh, my entire Facebook persona at this point is is really just episodic kayak fishing tournaments. Um, the best way to find me is on uh, Snagline, um, Redfish Twelve. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions there. I think unfortunately the you know the um, the internet uh, forum fishing sites are dead. I mean I think the advent of Instagram and Facebook and other things like that have really killed it. Uh, we do have a Facebook uh, kayak fishing forum. I think it's called Chesapeake Bay Kayak Anglers. Uh, you can find us there. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, uh, I'm kind of in receive mode. So if somebody asks a question, I'll, I'll chime in. But I'm not really contributing as much as I probably should be. Um, because I just feel like when I started out, there wasn't any resources. And so, like, we we had a blog. We had this we had this forum. We had a tournament. We had all these things and trying to try and encourage people to get into it. Now there's so many resources. There's mm -hmm. kayak angler. There's on the water. I mean, there's... There's YouTube I and mean, Robert Fields has covered so many different fisheries in so many different states um, that there's so many more resources out there that I just feel like, hey, this is uh, this is pretty covered. But if anybody has questions, you know, you can find me on on Facebook, you can find me on Snagline, you can find me on uh, on a, on a couple different couple of different mediums. But um, I'm always I'm always you know I, I think you asked some uh, somebody this in one of your recent. Um, uh, shows of like, Hey, what's, what's your goal for this year? What's your, you know, what are, what are your things that you're looking for? Yep, beat me to it. Oh, really? That was the next yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I say this every year and, and I, you, we, so, so, so back to Snagline, we didn't talk about as much about it, but like, uh, it was a really cool forum. And, and one of the things that we did every year was like, what's your kayak resolution? Like, what is, what are you going to do this year that you haven't done before? And like, you asked me about snakehead on a fly. It was my kayak resolution for like six years. Oof. Like every year listed, you know, number one kayak, kayak, uh, snakehead fly rod. I, it hasn't happened yet. So one of the things that I really enjoy the most, and I would say has continued to be my goal is I love taking people that are new to the sport out. I love convincing them that, Hey, you don't need a Hobie. You don't need a $150 milk crate. You don't need these things. All you need is a rod and a reel and a buddy and we'll, we'll hook you up. We'll, we'll put you on fish. We'll, we'll get you in a spot where you're going to enjoy it. And I, uh, Every year I take people out that are new and, and that's always my goal. I, I really enjoy that. My dude, you are an ambassador to the sport. You really are. And thank you so much for spending time with us. Just, just us getting me and everyone in the audience to learn a little bit more about this. And that's the thing, the longer I do this, you, you pull back these pieces and I don't care if you're a trout guy, snakehead guy, saltwater kayak, fishing bass. We all care about this ecosystem. It's about the fish. And if we all can come together and learn and educate ourselves, we can help promote 
the, the protection of these fisheries. Uh, I grew up in the Shenandoah when there was a massive fish kill. And, uh, you know, after talking to the Shenandoah river keepers and stuff, it took everyone coming together to finally try to solve that problem. And so if we can all come together and like, just put, put aside our biases of what's better, um, just for a little bit and come together, our voices can be heard a little bit more and we can make a difference here. But again, guys, like and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. Hey, I appreciate it. Thank you. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.